Hello everyone, I'm Colin Hambrook, editor of Disability Arts Online. I'm an older white man wearing glasses and a black hoodie, and I'm sitting in a very messy home office. Welcome to the fifth artist presentation in our series of online events. Ellen Renton is a young Scottish poet and performer with albinism. She has a master's degree in creative writing from the University of East Anglia, and at the end of 2019, debuted her poetry show, With Insight, with support from Unlimited and Creative Scotland. Ellen explores the role of sight in poetry, touching on themes of imagery, the cultural significance of blindness, and the hierarchy of the senses. In the film, Ellen sits close to the camera, sitting in a room with patterned wallpaper with a door behind her. She's a young white woman with long blonde hair. Send your questions for Ellen to answer in the Q&A section after her talk via the Facebook or YouTube comment sections or the hashtag DowCovidCommissions. So now I'm going to hand over to Ellen and I'll see you again at the end for the Q&A session. Hi, uh, my name is Ellen and welcome to this week's talk uh, in the Disability Arts Online fortnightly series. Um, today I'm going to be speaking to you about poetry and vision. I'm going to talk about my relationship with each of these things uh, and my perspective of the relationship that exists between the two. I'm going to read a few poems that I've written um, and make reference to some work by other poets too. Uh, to introduce myself, uh, my name is Ellen Renton and I'm a 24 year old poet from Edinburgh. I've been performing my own work for about five years. Um, some on my own, some of that with uh, In The Works Spoken Word Theatre Company. Um, and I have a master's in creative writing and poetry from the University of East Anglia, which is where I carried, a lot, carried out a lot of the research that I'm gonna speak about today. My most recent project, which is obviously uh, on hold at the moment, uh, was with Insight, which was a solo poetry theatre show about albinism, ableism and the Paralympics. In terms of my vision, I have a condition called oculocutaneous albinism, which results in my body being unable to produce melanin, leading to pale hair, skin and eyes, and ultimately leading to partial sight. Um, for those who this means anything to, um, my glasses or contact lenses are fitted for a 648 prescription. So very crudely, that means I have around 12% of my vision. But it's complicated by other conditions, um, including nystagmus, uh, photophobia, astigmatism. Um, I wouldn't often <laughs> introduce myself in that manner, reeling off these things, but I think um, hopefully it gives some context in terms of what I'm speaking about today. So I'm going to start with a poem that I wrote quite a few years ago, not long after I performed for the first time. Um, and in this poem, I'm very explicitly trying to write about the experience of my vision. It's called Meet Me There. I find your shape in thick falling fog. Your eyes, nose, lips, like hasty errors crumbed in grey from rubbings out. Your chest, arms dressed in the crowd, legs absorbing concrete. Do you pull morning tight around you like a coat? Or does it wear you? From my blurred perch, I can't be sure. But you look like my earliest works. Pages greased with crayon that frowning teachers tossed aside. Because life should stay within the lines. I came across this poem 
a couple of years ago. Um, and I remembered the difficulty I'd encountered in explaining my vision, deliberately trying to write about it head on. Um, and I think it's very obvious to me anyway in that poem that that's what I'm trying to do. There is really no common language to speak about vision. Um, there's a great essay by Virginia Woolf on pain. She writes about the idea that it's so hard to communicate the level of pain that we feel because there is no sort of common way of describing it. And I think it's very similar for vision and for most medicalized things. Um, it's not within sort of our everyday speech. Um, we don't have lots of things we can hold on to um, and lots of ways we can explain it. And I think in this poem, I'm describing my sight in terms of how a sighted person might want me to. I think I'm assuming a reader, which is always slightly dodgy territory. Um, so my vision isn't blurry to me. It's what I know, it's how it's, I can see the most um, I've ever been able to see, if that makes sense. Um, but it would look blurry to a sighted person who somehow had my vision simulated for them. So I was trying to describe my sight in a way that sort of so everyone would know what I meant rather than actually describe it from my own experience. And when I noticed that in my own writing, I became interested and quite determined to consider the role of vision in poetry more carefully. And I tried to read up on the place of vision in poetry. Um, I felt that blindness specifically holds a very significant spot in the cultural imagination, particularly when it comes to poetry. Blindness is so frequently used as a metaphor, as a way of explaining other things. It has so many connotations when we see it written down in a poem. So many famous poems make use of it. Um, also the idea of a, of a blind poet, the blind poet is a sort of mythical figure. Um, someone like Homer, for instance, his sight is a large part of how his work is read and perceived. Poets themselves are considered to have some kind of other sight anyway, I think, if you think about the language used to speak about someone like Kate Tempest, for instance. She's always spoken about as if she were a prophet, as if she can see a future that other people can't. Um, there's a very famous quote from Allen Ginsberg's, the preface to Allen Ginsberg's Howl, um, written by William Carlos Williams. And he says, poets are damned, but they're not blind. They see with the eyes of the angels. And I think that again leads to this idea that poets are considered to have something that the rest of the world does not. So there's definitely, that exists, and then there's also this idea that blind people have this other sense. Um, I've been thinking a lot about the myth of Tiresias recently. Um, he was blind, but had the ability to see the future. He had second sight. And so I think that myth has had a huge impact on how blind people are perceived generally. And so when you combine what's expected of blind people and what's expected of poets, it does create some sort of otherworldly figure in the cultural imagination. Um, when it comes to partially blind people and partially blind poets, both of these expectations do exist, but there are fewer cultural touchstones for partial sight. And our language definitely falls down when it comes to partiality. Um, I think in general, we struggle um, to comprehend things that don't necessarily exist within a binary. Two poets with partial sight whose work has been particularly important to me personally and in terms of this research are Audre Lorde and John Heath Stubbs. Audre Lorde being one of the most famous, celebrated poets of the 20th century. From what I have read, from what I can understand, her vision was of a fairly similar level to mine. 
She was born partially sighted and received glasses as a young child. Whereas John Heath Stubbs, who was an English 20th century poet, had a degenerative visual condition. He was born partially sighted um, and his sight gradually worsened until he fully lost his vision at the age of 60. Um, which is particularly interesting in terms of partial sight in his writing because his vision changes. So if you look across his work, it does have a differing impact as time goes on. I found when I was reading both of their work that they rarely addressed it head on. They rarely wrote a poem which announced itself to be about vision, but once I knew about their respective conditions, I could find so much more in their poems. It was like another sort of layer of meaning that everyone might not have access to. Um, but because I know what to look for, I knew what to look for. Um, and I realised that there were similarities between their case and my own. There was more that I could find there. Um, and I will refer to both of them throughout this, probably. Um, I'm going to read another poem, which is about sight in, in its own way. Um, I wore glasses from a very young age and only wore contact lenses. began to wear them a couple of years ago. It's really unusual to have an entirely new visual experience in your 20s. Um, so it was a very interesting time. And one of the most sort of significant parts of beginning to wear lenses was the difficulty in getting them in. Some of you might be able to appreciate. Um, and that's what this is about, or was inspired by. And it's called Contact. Drawn folds show blotched dawn. Yawn. Roll on robes of smoke, thoughts fog soaked, raw. Hold on. Crawl to those o's of hope to compose. No more, don't drop. Those globes won't thaw what floats, throat locked, all floor torn. Oh, oh, not on those. On go. Slow, not launched nor thrown, soft, so close. Go on, left, done, one down, one to go. Please lend me the world whole, not kept under dust for someone else. Ah, oh, nearly, too early to beg for body to work yet, each bone sleep poached. Forget the rush. Don't leap nor rub, just gentle touch. Yes, contact. Each time I'm almost surprised by what the morning looks like, but not quite. Today it woke me speechless. Now I've got my tongue back. found that this experience of putting lenses in and wearing lenses was hard to explain in visual terms and so I wanted to use an alternative system and so I relied on sound a lot in that poem. In the earliest stage of the poem where I'm describing waking up and having the lowest personal level of vision, I tried to write only using words with vowel sounds that stem from O. Um, and then at the point in the poem where one lens is in, I introduced E and U sounds, and in the very latter stages added in A and I. Um, I think someone listening might not necessarily pick up specifically what I was doing there. I chose those specific vowels all because of the sort of hollowness and rolling into, sounds rolling into each other, then adding in E and U. I'd say they're the lesser used. 
of the remaining vowels and ending with I. It's the idea of the sort of whole person coming together, feeling like yourself um, when you're able to see things. And yeah, so the average person listening or anyone listening or reading that poem probably wouldn't notice that. I probably wouldn't notice that in a poem. But I would hope was hoping that consciously or otherwise they would pick up on something. I wanted to create the sensation of something being difficult, something being stilted, happening slowly, and gradually something becoming easier as the poem went on. A condition um, or a sensation maybe that I experience as a result of partial sight is synesthesia. In my case, that tends to manifest itself in terms of um, my head sort of attributing a colour to a day of the week, attributing a taste to a sound. It's about sounds, senses, sorry, joining up in ways that they maybe necessarily don't always for everybody. Um, and that's also a poetic technique, um, which I tried to use here explaining one sense through the language of another sense. One thing that I'm particularly interested in, in terms of this research, which relates to synesthesia as well, is the hierarchy of the senses, um, which is the idea that senses are prioritised over others. And most modern research on this points to the fact that it's not medical, it's cultural and social implications which affect the importance of our senses. Um, it's also generally considered that currently, especially in Western culture, vision is deemed as the most significant and vital sense. Um, it's some research which I looked at by Dr. David Feeney. Um, it's a lot of, if you're interested, a lot of interesting work in this. He argues that Western philosophy has, does privilege sight and that we consider thinking and seeing to be much the same thing. He looks back um, throughout history when discussing how social implications affect the hierarchy. He argues, for instance, between, he says, the 16th and 18th century, touch was considered to be at the top of the hierarchy probably or possibly because of its importance in manual labour and the prevalence of that during that time. But the idea of sight being deemed at the top of the hierarchy has come from around the 18th century onwards, which I suppose comes with the timing of the Industrial Revolution and the rise of capitalism and more recently with the technological revolution. And so I think synesthesia is a way of destabilizing that hierarchy. Using synesthesia within poetry is a way of playing with the senses. Written poetry obviously is, it privileges sight. Um, but by playing around with synesthesia, using different senses, bringing them onto the page, it rearranges the hierarchy a little bit. Um, John Heath Stubbs, and Lord use this technique in their writing. Heath Stubbs in one of his poems that's particularly strong on it is the Chucking Out Bells of Soho in the 40s and 50s, which borrows the form of um, oranges and lemons, nursery rhyme. And so sound and music and rhythm kind of become the main drivers of that poem rather than a visual poetic form on the page. And a Lord poem in which it's particularly prevalent is one of my favourites called Pirouette, where she borrows the form of the dance step, the pirouette, um, and the poem becomes this sort of dizzying physical object um, that's full of like, kinetic energy, makes you feel like you're spinning, um, and it kind of comes off the page at you. So it becomes a lot more than a visual object. This next poem that I'm going to read has some similar formal ideas 
takes a synesthetic approach. Um, although it's not directly about vision in the way that contact was, uh, it's called real, R-E-E-L. My head plays chicken and egg with the fiddle and the bad posture. Did the slump come halfway up a D major scale when I still got stickers for practicing? Held a bowl like it were something precious and dead. Did I wilt my frame to perch on the staves? Let my pupils see themselves like babies in a viewfinder. Do you recognize her? That's you making those sounds, that's you. Did I curve myself to crotch it? Did my knees sink to let my feet tap, to let my elbows no faster? Shank file down to feather that teased the semi-quavers faster? Did it fit the hunch that I'd always had? Did the wood rest safe on my forearm? Did I bow my head in prayer or thanks? Did my back, lungs, neck hurt? Did my breath, did I think I would uncoil? With every year the case lay neglected. I wanted that poem to feel like music um, and so I was thinking about synesthesia when choosing the form for it. The poem does speak about vision in a very small way, um, how it affects posture, um, how if you've sort of spent a lot of life bent over and trying to see something closely it does affect your physical stance but largely um, most significantly to me, the poem is about music and it's about those things that we devote so much time to when we're younger um, that we give up for reasons we either do or don't understand as we get older. And for me, in the case of that poem, it was violin or fiddle playing um, and I played in a pl traditional Scottish music in a Keeley band and so for this poem, I adopted the form of a song we used to play in that band called the Hoy Song, um, which was a piece that got quicker and quicker and quicker. And I loved the sort of communication between the band and the dancers, both very heavily reliant on each other, but both also sort of egging the other on. Um, and when it reached the final bar of music and the final step of the dance, there would be this big sort of collective exhalation, this huge sigh as everyone kind of collapsed from being able to continue at the pace we were going at. And so I wanted to use that pace and try and translate that onto the page. Um, obviously, once a poem is written down, there are certain formal poetic visual conventions that it adheres to, but um, I didn't use punctuation for this poem. I want I just used space on the page um, as a way of um, showing breaks and dictating pace. I wanted the poem to be led by the song as opposed to anything visual or formal on the page, which to me returns to this idea of the hierarchy of the senses. The fact that I was more reliant on sound than something visual here, I would say it's not always in a sort of big um, conscious political decision uh, to make a statement by relying on another sense in poetry. But I think in the case of this poem, I would argue that the use of music is a very small way of destabilising the hierarchy of the senses even if that only is within the context of this one page of poetry. Um, I consider to be writing, writing to be a very uninhibiting form of creativity. Um, for me, it allows me to make my own working conditions in a way. And if the hierarchy of the senses props up and exists because of the social model of disability, as I believe it to, I think that playing around with, with senses a bit here does create an enabling space. Um, 
I found that in writing and in performance, one of the best things for me about making things and writing is learning how to make them on your own terms um, and not within the constraints set by someone else. And so when I'm writing now and trying to think about the hierarchy of the senses, trying to think about my vision, I try to imagine, you know, I think it's good to imagine a, what a world that accommodates you and your particular needs would be like and then to try to recreate those conditions in your art. Um, in this poem, I suppose I was still writing about the way in which my vision allows me to engage with the world, even if I wasn't doing that explicitly, because sound and vision, sorry, sound and rhythm are incredibly important in terms of my senses and in terms of how I understand things. Um, so even though I wasn't explicitly writing a vision poem, you can bring it in in other ways, I think. I would say that particularly in my case, but I imagine in the case of many other people too, when visual impairment is a system, of, a symptom of a much more complex condition, um, I find it very easy to forget that ultimately all the visual impairment is in its purest and most uncomplicated sense is a different way of seeing the world. It becomes a lot more than that, um, mainly because of things that happen in society, but ultimately that's, that's really all it is. Um, and I was reminded of this recently from a tweet uh, by Dr. Amy Kavanagh, who is visually impaired also. And she noted that she had just discovered that sighted people were able to see the rain. And this was a big revelation to me because I didn't know that rain was visible to anyone. Um, and the more I, th I found this so fascinating um, and almost quite exciting to know that there were still things I could learn about the world. Very small, simple, but beautiful things. Um, I realised I never, I'd never needed to know that the rain was visible because there are countless ways you know it's raining um, and you don't need to see it to know that. And so I wrote this poem uh, in response to that. It was raining. And I only know this because we took the last space in the car park. It was an unconvincing summer on the whole. We drove hospital to here at an all time slow and watched gutters get hopeless. A token patch of grass reached a cartoon shade of green. I had to roll up the volume dial like dough just to hear every lyric. But even through sealed windows, the evening was so close it held my throat from singing. We grew stale where we sat and mum said he'll be soaked. You finally arrived, but all at once. Soap opera in your footsteps, hood up. I think so much of the language around poetry is based on vision um, image, for example. Um, it heavily leans towards the idea that the poet is some sort of visual translator. The poet should be able to see something, write it down, and any reader should be able to recreate that image that the poet once saw in their head. Um, and John Heath Stubbs and Audre Lorde both have quite interesting approaches to creating images. Heath Stubbs noted that because he was losing his sight, he felt like he had a sort of store in images in his mind's eye. Um, and he was worried about those slipping away as he lost more of his vision. But he also frequently referenced the fact that he, our mind is so capable of creating things without being able to see 
we can still see so much. Um, our mind fills in for us so much. And Lord spoke about um, when she first got glasses as a very young child and the moment when she realised that trees were not green clouds on a trunk. As she, she thought she could see green, green clouds and white clouds um, and she'd never noticed the leaves. She'd never been able to see freely what a tree was. And I think um, anecdotes like that, um, the impact of that is very obvious through her work and the way in which she builds images. A lot of images that might seem surreal to one person um, make perfect sense because of seeing the world differently. It definitely part of what I've learned through reading visually impaired poets and trying to study more about this is that it's good to learn to express images in a way that are not necessarily rooted in universality. I think because of our education system and the elitism associated with poetry, we are, we're trained to be alienated by it. Um, and so therefore when we read a poem, we desperately search for things that we can recognise as universal because a poem is very intimidating. Um, and it's a comfort to read what we know. And often it's, it's very important too. It's good to see your own experiences reflected. But I think I grew accustomed to reading poems about a visual experience that I could not relate to at all. And in a, a sort of determination to make work that could be understood by other people, I wrote about my vision like I was explaining it. Um, like in the first poem I read at the beginning of the talk, I wrote about my sight like it was abnormal. And as I try to develop as a writer and improve, I'm thinking about this a lot um, and how I can learn how to write about my own experience without apology, because I think that's really important. And I suppose if you learn how to normalise your own experience, and the way in which you engage with the world in your own work, then it makes it much easier to imagine other settings where that might be possible for you and for your readers or listeners in the case of poetry. Um, and I think, yeah, demand of the page, what you would demand of society, destabilise the hierarchy of the senses, make the conditions that work for you and write about the world that you live in. Um, if you're interested in a little bit more reading, um, The Colour of Sound is a brilliant collection by John Heath Stubbs. Um, and the poems are referenced by Audrey Lorde. Uh, the Black Unicorn is one of her incredible collections I can recommend. Um, I think Pirouette I read in Undersong, which is a selection of her work. Um, yeah. Thank you very much for listening uh, and if you have any questions, do just let us know. Thanks for that very, very thoughtful presentation, Ellen. Um, we've we've um, already had some some uh, um, some comments um, through the Facebook feed. Uh, Sarah Pitbull said, "Loved hearing about the the hierarchy of the senses." And um, Tandy Bush said, "This is absolutely fascinating. Find the poems very moving and crafting." Uh, wow, how have I missed Ellen Renton? She says. <laughs> um, I, I've I've got a few few questions to to start mm -hmm. us off, and then then there may be other other questions coming in through the um, social media. 
Mm -hmm. um, your, your poem, Meet Me There, um, describes a way of seeing from the perspective of a, a sighted person who asserts that life should stay within the lines. Um, have you th thought about writing a different version of, of, of that poem, maybe one that celebrates um, the absence of definition and a sense of a connection between all things? Yeah, I, I suppose that um, that final kind of line in that poem, I was thinking of it as a from the perspective of the I in the not that the, the I is in the the speaker, the the individual, the subject of the poem. For them, remembering that line being said to them is a sort of moment of realization that the whole time they were drawing their life correctly, their life does exist outside the lines. Um, mm -hmm. and about a sort of prescribed way of seeing the world that we especially enforce on children I think and mm. not visually impaired thinking that everyone else is seeing one thing and you alone are seeing something else therefore makes that incorrect rather than it just being a different way of seeing mm -hmm. um, but, but yeah I think so I think Hopefully, um, poems I've written about it more recently manage to do that. Man, manage to kind of speak about it in the other the other side of things, the more positive way. Mm -hmm. mm. It's 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 a beautiful poem, and um, but I've, in you know traditional and popular song and poetry, um, we so often come across the metaphor of sight for understanding and the implication that lack of sight is a state of ignorance and confusion um mm -hmm. kind of i suppose one of the most kind of famous is uh, amazing grace with its line i was i once was lost um but now i'm fine was bl was blind but now i i see mm -hmm. um I, d I wondered what you think is the the impact of these kinds of tropes um and as you know aside from the reinforcement of the binary i think well on on one hand in terms of writing it means that when you write about blindness people assume you're writing about something else um mm. i think especially in poetry people think it's sort of people are looking for more all the time people don't want to just take what's on the page people always think there must be other meanings or something else in there. And sometimes just writing about blindness is just writing about sight. Um, it's almost like that term has been redefined because it's been used within the context of speaking about ignorance or lack of knowledge. Um, and yeah, I do, I do think culturally it's used so much. It's, it's near enough a synonym now for ignorance, something like blindness. Um, and I do think, I would hope that sort of while I, I don't imagine that able-bodied people look at a blind person and think they're blind, therefore they must not be intelligent. I don't think it's sort of affected it to that extent, but I do think it contributes to this sort of cultural lessering or um, the idea that disabled means unable. I think all these kind of negative terms do whether it's happening con happening consciously or not, I think it does end up mm. contributing to that. Um, and I also think I, it's not the sort of thing where on the individual usage, I wouldn't find it offensive if someone, you know, speaking to me used that metaphor, so to speak. But I do think it's a case of not not using the words that we actually mean to use and not saying exactly what we mean, which you know, blindness isn't something that can be helped, but but ignorance can. So I think to some, for someone to say, I've oh, okay. been to this before now, is a way of like letting yourself off the hook a little bit. It's a way of um, uh -huh. kind of shifting responsibility from yourself. Um, and if we continue to use it in that way, that might affect how people think of blindness, as opposed to blindness being sort of the starting point for, for that phrase. Mm -hmm. It's it's very interesting what you say about Dr. David Feeney's ideas about the 
the change from touch to sight mm. um, as from the 18th century onwards. And I guess if if touch were dominant, we'd talk more about what things feel like um, rather than what they look like, and we'd talk less about clarity and more about the the, the texture of proximity and closeness it would be more nuanced and listening to your poetry the, the way you write about you know, different times of the day as objects to be physically engaged with for example um you're describing images in terms of of touch um and it, it made me think you know within the ideas that you're proposing you're kind of advocate advocating for associating thinking more with feeling than with seeing um and i'm just i'm just wondering if you know if the world with had more of a value of touch would it would it be a kind of world um in that emphasis on closeness and uh, mm -hmm. the things that bind us rather than things that separate us i suppose um like for me personally a world where touch is prioritised as a sense would be a much easier one to navigate. Um, I think just now the gulf between the senses being prioritised in terms of vision being at the top and touch being at the bottom um, has been really increased given current circumstances um, and yeah, being able to having to engage with things from a distance and it not being safe to touch in the way that you might have done. I do think that's increased, but I think also the times when touch was considered to be further up the hierarchy weren't probably necessarily a better time for disabled people generally. You know, that's still, no. I think, I suppose the, the idea of the hierarchy is that whenever a hierarchy exists, it's never going to be fully inclusive. Um, so I suppose I'm thinking about a system that allows everyone to work within their own needs and where where something isn't privileged above something else is being a better system rather than the hierarchy existing at all, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, yes. I think my Wi-Fi is slightly wobbling a little bit. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, as a... A few questions that have have come in from from the audience. Uh, um, uh, so, Tanvir Bush, she'd like to ask um, how you negotiate the promotion and dissemination of your poetry in terms of being a poet or marketing as a blind poet. Mm, that's quite interesting. Um, I think often with poetry the output of things is out of your hands, like especially at an early stage, you know, I like, might try and send a poem into a journal. And if that gets accepted, I've got absolutely no say in how that is printed or the, the font they use or, so it is quite difficult because I suppose it's the same with anything in publishing, but the, the wit doesn't make those choices. Um, but I, do a lot of performance work as well. And I find that within that, I'm able to make my own rules a wee bit more. Um, in terms of marketing and things, I generally, until recently, I sort of kept that out of things generally. Um, even initially, I was quite wary of sort of, if I was performing, I wouldn't want all the poems in a particular set to be specifically speaking about vision. I never wanted that to um, so sort of, yeah, like I spoke about in the talk, the idea of the blind poet being some kind of mystical figure. I never really wanted to um, contribute to that. Um, mm. But I think my most kind of recent project was a, a, like an hour long performance piece. Um, which was about disability and ableism and vision. And I think while doing that, I sort of became comfortable with 
finding a way of marketing that and speaking about it in, on my own terms. I think it's just about finding the the language that's comfortable for you. And when other people are promoting you to have conversations with them, make sure everyone's comfortable with what's being said um, and that no one else is taking advantage of what they might consider to be a, a sort of unique <laughs> selling point or, you know, um, use that for their own game. I think it's just about doing it on your own terms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I wondered if you wanted to say a, a bit about your uh, your touring show with Insight was uh, cancelled due, due to yeah. the, the crisis. But um, is, is there a chance of, of us seeing that in a different form maybe? Um, yeah, hopefully. So it was a, a sort of hour-long poetry theatre show, um, partly based on my own experience, but also based on a, a fictional character, a young woman who, with albinism, who had just found out she'd been unsuccessful in getting a place in the GB Athletics Paralympics team. So it was the show was her kind of going for a run. Um, and it was multi we had music and film and a few other elements as well. Um, and it was about yeah, ableism um, and disability representation expectations um, and the idea of the Paralympics being held up as the sort of one thing for disabled people to aim for, the one time you see yourself represented culturally. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, we just began a tour at the start of March, but obviously um, that was all brought to a halt. So hopefully... Um, kind of working on ways we can maybe um, disseminate some of that digitally and so hopefully there might be some kind of alternative version soon. I would look forward look forward to that. Um, Joe, Joe asked about um, he asked a couple of questions actually um, kind of going back to your your research and how Wondering how it relates to other forms of literature and art, um, and, and he, he mentions the novel Perfume, which obviously is kind of translated through the sense of smell. Yeah. And uh, he just wondered if your research kind of bordered into those territories when kind of thinking about synesthesia. Yeah, um, I haven't so much. Um, I look definitely at, um, I'm very interested in, it's quite a, a common thing in modernist literature. Um, in which sort of the format of the novel was shaken up a bit and everything didn't follow a linear structure. Um, and things like Proust, for example, there's the famous um, moment with the Madeleines. He walks out and smells, gets the smell, and that brings on a memory. And so the senses kind of lead to the structure, and that was a really common thing in a lot of literature around that time um, and that is a lot more similar to how people work I think that's a lot more of a realistic representation of what goes on in our heads all of our thoughts don't you know sort of follow a timeline um, but primarily when I was looking into all this I was thinking about poetry specifically but definitely I think I think it probably varies in, in different art forms actually, especially in music, because that's written in a very different way. And also probably, I suppose arguably less of it, it's less of a visual um, visual art form. Um, but yeah. mm. And um, following on from that, Joe, Joe remarked on the, the lyrical style of your poetry and relationship to sound. And he, he wondered if you, dabbled at all in 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 hip-hop um no not so much no I have um worked with I really enjoy I think poetry is a very good art form for collaboration um and f fusing with other things so I've been involved in a few film projects I find poetry film really exciting um and with musicians as well a couple of different projects with different musicians um, of very different styles, some more kind of acoustic, more recently a sort of more electronic project. Um, 
and so yeah I, do, I think poetry and music it it can create something really special when it's put together I think mm -hmm. Def definitely definitely um yeah there's there's more great comments um uh, Tambi commented again that you know, how how strong it was to to hear about you writing about um, the experience of, of, of being partially sighted um, without apology. Um, we grow into this. Uh, I hope so, and then we grow beyond it. She says. Mm, that's nice. Yeah. Um. Um. I I I wanted to ask. Um, about contact, mm -hmm. sort of kind of going back a bit. Um, it's it's a very tasty poem, and I, I really enjoyed your your thoughts on synesthesia to subvert the hierarchy of the senses. And I, I wondered if you could say a bit more about um, about sight being privileged within poetry generally, but mm -hmm. what other ideas you might have on on um, what that means for poetry as an art form, and um, you know, subverting that 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 tradition. Um, you know, perhaps I mean, I mean, contact also reminded me a bit of kind of sound poetry, which is mm. established form. And I, I wondered if if you had ideas around kind of things growing, developing. Mm. Yeah, I think I think especially for me because I kind of come from a performance poetry background a bit. I did a lot of that. Um, and for me, that's a way, similar to the question earlier about um, uh, publishing and how does that work? You know, how is the you know, poetry world built for sighted, uh, for visually impaired people? Um, I think performance has allowed me to play around with that quite a lot. Um, because it becomes, it's still visual to an, an extent, but also it's to do with, I make this particular noise with my mouth, if I read this bit a certain way, if I speed up or slow down or, um, and also to do with physical, if I move my body a certain way while I'm reading it. And I think that whole, I mean, performance poetry has been around for forever and poetry is an oral tradition, but um definite sort of recent boom in that I would say last 10 years or so um has allowed a lot of different kinds of poetry to come out um a lot of people I see so many people perform and they sort of sing part of their poems and kind of go in and out of different voices different characters um and a lot of people yeah playing around with sound in ways um yeah it's interesting because i think performance it, it's still um while it does allow you to do all these things it is sometimes i was just thinking i often get um people often say afterwards um i can't, can't believe you remembered it all can't believe you performed that from memory and i think that's really funny because the assumption i i, I sort of my eyes are more likely to let me down than my memory is. So the idea of me reading something off the page in front of an audience is really scary. Um, mm. Sometimes I do that, but it's a lot, I feel, feel a lot more comfortable doing it from memory. And I think, so while performance is quite a liberating space for me, there are sort of reminders every so often that it's still considered, um, way is still considered the easiest way and is still assumed everyone performing mm -hmm. yeah absolutely and um you know kind of learning by memory is it, it's so important to kind of physicality mm. uh when when you're performing and um um it's, yeah it's a shame there's not more of an emphasis on that mm. absolutely Thank you very much, Alan. It's a really, really thoughtful um, presentation. Really, really enjoyed it. We could we could carry on talking for <laughs> ages. I think there's there's yeah. just so much 
there condensed into a kind of very very short space of time and uh you know i, I think there's a whole phd there <laughs> <laughs> to be explored kind of looking at you know the um the hierarchy of the senses mm. um yeah i want to thank everyone who's um joined us this afternoon as 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 well it's been a fascinating presentation and discussion um and this this week there are two ways to feed back um we've set up a poll on the time of day for broadcasting future presentations and we've also pasted the link to feedback forms on our artist presentations on youtube and facebook so we'd really appreciate your help by uh, filling those in um it's just left for me to say that our next artist presentation is on Wednesday, the 5th of August, the time of the broadcast being dependent on your feedback. And it's with musician and composer Chaz the Sweet, who's a fantastic um, electric violinist. And um, he, he's going to be demonstrating his, his use of the power of different effects with the electric violin and uh, exploring how the sounds can evoke other realities. So um, really look for, looking forward to that. Um, so thanks, Ellen. Really, Thank really nice to chat with you and um, see you all again. Cheers.